Hello and welcome to the Verderon channel. I'm Pierre Delancey. For my 40 audio interviews so far, this is perhaps the most difficult one. Not because my guest has been anything other than delightful, but rather because the story we cover is an important one. And yet, it's a story that few have wanted to believe, and even some of its protagonists have tried to elude it. The proposal is simple. In the 1990s, a network of 20 centers for contemporary art opened in rapid succession in capitals of the freshly liberated Eastern Europe. These centers were founded by George Soros, the world's most generous contemporary philanthropist, and his Open Society Institute. The Influencing Machine, a book and exhibition by my guest Aaron Moulton, examines the influence of this network on the art practices of the region and the contribution to heralding pro-Western, neoliberal values in post-Soviet states. While none of this should be beyond the bounds of art history, Aaron's account has met with scepticism and opposition. The reasons for this reception have become an extension of the work itself and point to an uncomfortable alliance between the art industry and sometimes obscure and powerful interests. I think this is a crucial inquiry whose implications should be taken seriously because if a single NGO could take the credit for creating the cultural values of a whole region without being called to account, it's not unlikely that art continues to propagate false consciousness without even knowing it. I'm happy that Aaron Moulton joins me now to discuss his research and some of these issues. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Pierre. Aaron, I, I came across your work in a file marked Taboo, which excited me very, very quickly, which is why we're here. But before we get into the conspiracy corner, this is, by the way, a new segment on the show. Before we get into that, I think we want to establish your credentials as a normie. And I think we share some of those credentials in kind of uncomfortable ways. So go for it. Who are you? Or indeed, who were you before you sold out to the dark forces? Pierre, I, I appreciate this introduction. I believe you and I could be on the same path somehow. <laughs> uh, I am a uh, curator by trade, but I kind of prefer to consider what I do as a uh, gonzo anthropology, and I and I wear a curatorial mm -hmm. mask to rationalize my behavior. And uh, but my work as a curator has been in a variety of different institutions. Uh, I was the in-house curator for Gagosian Gallery for a number of years, making exhibitions across the global brand, uh, group shows and whatnot. And I also ran the Utah Museum of Contemporary Art as a curator, a senior curator there. And and at one point in my life, I had a gallery in Berlin called Feinkost, mm -hmm. where you and I shared a number of the same artists. And, and it yeah, was, we uh, did. God, good times. And uh, and that's uh, and what's what else to say? I've been in Los Angeles for the last ten years, and I kind of did this radical project that happened in June at the Ujedowski Castle that we're going to discuss. And mm -hmm. uh, and I've kind of become a, 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 in my own right, a cultural refugee. I've moved to Denmark, <laughs> and uh, and I, it's my wife's homeland. And uh, I'm wanting to raise my kids here for the next ten years and figure out how relevant my research is outside of America, because I think in America the work I've been doing has been hard to place, uh, especially with this kind of strange cultural turns that the, the, the countries have. Okay, well, I hope we've piqued our listeners' interest with this a little bit. I have to say that in the video feed that I can see, it looks like you're hiding in a basement, so this cultural refuge isn't going all that well so far. Okay, so as you mentioned, we're going to be talking about an exhibition and a research project which was manifested in Warsaw's Ujazdowski Castle. Your project is called The Influencing Machine. I think we need to get down to the bottom. What is the, what is the thesis of your project? Because this is not just an exhibition, but it's rather an attempt to uncover, theorize, and explode a bit of what, as you say, slightly hidden history of contemporary art. Uh, yeah, it's really, uh, it's very hard for me to sum this up in a quick way, but the, this is a culmination of 17 years of a, a life's passion, a, a research project that really starts when I'm a journalist, when I was running Flash Art, I was editor of Flash Art. Mm -hmm. And I discovered in my research, in my journalistic work, this mention of the Soros Center for Contemporary Art. And, and at that time in my life, I felt very well read within the realms of what was the evolution of the global art world, the globalization of the art world. And that was on my own. I was like a nerd. Mm -hmm. And then and then I did a curating degree in London that was you know all about post-colonial theory and all these things that were going to 
make it more comprehensive. And so when I discovered this thing as a journalist on my own at Flash Art, I was like, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. This is wild. You know, as soon as you start Googling it, there's another and another, but then there's nothing, you know, there's like this strange critique, but really it was like a huge blind spot where I'm like, this is not just a reference point for the globalization of art, but this is maybe the cornerstone if we really have to take it serious and look at what it represents. And then when you uncover it, you realize there's there were 20 of these things. They were in every major capital following the fall of the Soviet Union. Every major city, uh, Belgrade, Sarajevo, Tallinn, Prague, and, uh, and so forth, all of the uh, former uh, USSR in terms of Eastern Europe suddenly had overnight one of these things appear. And I just thought, this is wild. This is a, this is a, a research topic. And so I just took it on independently on my own and, and traveled to 10 of these places to mm -hmm. explore it. And how do we get to today is really tough. Uh, it's already, I'm you know, just going on and on about mm -hmm. this moment uh -huh. back in two, 2005. But I had a thing happen to me. In 2006, when I did my research trip, I went to 10 of these cities. And what happened in 2006 was, okay, I'm going to do this research trip. I'm going to do a travelogue, reportage on the, you know, what is the, what are the arts infrastructures and art scenes like in these cities post Soros, post SCCA, because 2006. And I was naive. I was just, I'm, I'm very open-minded learning, uh, interested, enthusiastic. Uh, about just learning about new art scenes and uh, and I wasn't going to meet an actual Soros person uh, mm -hmm. until uh, Skopje, Macedonia. And it was in Skopje. I was doing all these interviews. I sat down for an interview with the former director of the SCCA Skopje named Nabosha Village. Mm -hmm. And when I was about to hit record, Nabosha was like, hey, uh, hold on a second. Uh, but before you before you hit record, I want to I want to be clear on something right now. I don't want to have any questions at all about how the programming was determined and whose ideas were what and and where things came mm -hmm. from. Okay, as long as we're super clear on that, I'm cool. Let's go. Are you clear? Are we good? I was like, yeah, dude. I just wanted to ask you about your art scene and if you, what, what you like about art, you know. And <laughs> and this shit went into my head like an earworm. Uh, I just kind of like had this turn, this conversation turn over and over for years. And it, I did the article. No big deal. I wrote something that would like address neoliberalism and the post Soros condition. Um, but it was, you know, it's flash art. You can only do like, I did 400 words on the history mm -hmm. of the SCCA and then the rest was travelogue, but the subject maintained itself in my mind uh, in a very passionate way. And then I started my gallery, which was a pan Eastern European gallery yep. of uh, artists that I met through this research trip and who were maintained. I, I kept a very close, intimate dialogue with, and I would always bring this thing up and, my curatorial work was always kind of reflecting yeah. ideas of this whole thing. I still haven't got to the influencing machine yet, but uh, that's okay. I... But I think I think maybe we need to we need to start feeding bits of the the hypothesis here. You've already mentioned the Soros network for contemporary art, and essentially mm -hmm. what we're going to be looking at is a network of, as you mentioned, twenty of these things which sprung up across Eastern Europe throughout the nineteen nineties. Maybe we need to clarify a whole bunch of things here because um, not all of our listeners will have an understanding of what Eastern Europe looks like in the 1990s, what a network center for it's contemporary art right might, might even be doing in those kind of circumstances, and maybe what this word Soros that you've mentioned a couple of times means because I, I, I imagine there might be, and this is kind of the frustration of some of our conversations and some of your research, there might be some people even involved in the contemporary art world who don't quite understand why that word is of any relevance. In introduce the picture before the conspiracy. Sure, sure. Yeah, no conspiracies, dude. It's all real. And uh, <laughs> to kind of sum that up, you know, I think the, this is, uh, this is an, a really important thing to address as an anomaly in art history and the evolution of the ecosystems of art, global art. Uh, imagine, like I said, overnight, these, um, these centers just start mushrooming in every major city, uh, 20 of them. What's the purpose of them? Well, they're there to help shepherd art making and ideas of art making into the 21st century. And for the most part, their function, it begins as uh, archives. Uh, I look at the archive as this kind of initiation rite that they all engage in to, to begin the process mm -hmm. of establishing themselves. So 
writing the lost art histories or the art histories of the lost decades of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. They become a repository for collecting all this information of art that was being made under socialism and under communism. And so, and this narrative that they're forming is, is in a way to show that there's this burgeoning, emergent, you know, uh, free spirit of the open society, of the individual who desires individual individuality coming through the oppressive forces of, of communism. And so they form these archives to establish this narrative. And, then, and their narrative is, is essentially built on that. From the 90s and forward, you have this amazing and very impactful work of the SCCA network, which is extremely well-funded, asymmetrically well-funded uh, in comparison to former government funding mm -hmm. uh, work that's going to be producing huge amounts of art for this period of time. And, and it's not just what they, the, the, their function is, I've said, the archive and, and then these, uh, this production of art. And that's through what's called the annual exhibition. So imagine there are 20 of these centers mm -hmm. and each, each center does an annual exhibition that's got this huge budget for production. But then there's also publishing and then there's uh, other kinds of uh, adjacent funding they're doing with uh, other exhibitions locally. And it's a, it's a, it's Conferences a general... Conferences as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a think tank and it's a, it's a production warehouse. Uh, it's, a, it's a production house on all these levels to help, uh, you know, bring new ideas and change, you know, be the change agent ultimately for helping um, this this very transformative moment in Eastern European history. And we have to remember a really key thing that I think is, is super special about this as a laboratory, as a visual cultural laboratory, is uh, the, the visual literacy and the visual culture uh, in a lot of places in Eastern Europe did not have advertising and marketing mm -hmm. in the way we think about it. Uh, I mean, certainly there were places that were more than others. You know, we think of Budapest or Prague or Warsaw as kind of, you know, most Western friendly, you know, yeah. visual visual cultures. And, and other places, you're you're talking about like a, a new radical shift in uh, perception management that's going to be established through this period. And it's literally a, uh, a laboratory where we can imagine this can offer a lot of opportunity for understanding the human experience in a very new way and establishing uh, narratives uh, in a very vulnerable sense. Okay. Well, listen, this, this so far doesn't look doesn't sound remotely suspicious. So I've either blown our introduction or we need to go one step back and make it really explicit for listeners why this might be so anomalous or why the effects that you are claiming of for these centers would be so surprising and so significant. So let's go back to 1989. I'd like you to describe maybe the way in which some of the early centers came about, how they were built, and to give us a sense of the backdrop against which they were establishing themselves. You already described the, the fact that they had access to a legacy of independent art making that would have been, of course, owned by the previous regime or either, either, either supported or suppressed by communist regimes, depending on the decade, depending on the country, because we're talking about you know, a very, very diverse region, Eastern Europe had all sorts of pol political solutions depending on where where exactly and when. Nonetheless, it's important to understand that actually 1989, 1990 brought very different degrees of freedom to different countries with attachment to very different ideologies. Right, 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 right. So the first Soros Center for Contemporary Art is referred to as Soros Foundation Fine Art Documentation Center. And it's in Budapest, mm -hmm. and uh, it starts in around 87, 88. And it's uh, in around 1990, 91. It takes on this name, SCCA, Soros mm -hmm. Center for Contemporary Art, the first one. And it's not until around 92 that all the others start to appear. And already in early 92, they're appearing, but they don't officially seem to emerge until the end of 92. But they're definitely in the cards, probably, you know, as far back as 91. There's a there's a whole process by which these things come about, and that's through the Open Society Institute, which is is a large NGO network. Uh, it's often referred to as the Open Society Foundation. I like mm -hmm. to call it the Open Society Institute because it has a more experimental uh, yeah. uh, name to it. And so they're essentially the big NGO that uh, George Soros has created to help bring in uh, open society values that are kind of handed down from Karl Popper, who's George Soros's mentor. And these are um, essentially 
in a way, the exportation of democracy and freedom and what become the uh, ethics and uh, mentality of of neoliberalism as a, as a structure in terms of how open society will work to uh, decentralize and reconfigure all the aspects of society to create a more freedom friendly place. But the thing that's you know important to always kind of remind yourself in because it's easy to get caught up in these details of like, well, what's the problem with this uh, whole thing? This seems like it's an important mm-hmm. moment uh, in these people's um, evolution to embrace these values. But these are these are all the bells and whistles of, of social engineering. You know, the the calling uh, talking about this whole thing under the auspices of art and art making and the you know helping establish free thinking creative people. Uh, that's a, um, in a way, a Trojan horse uh, for a lot of what the open society is doing, because they are coming in in a very kind of asymmetrically powerful way and changing multiple aspects of society. And art is one of them. It's like a tenth of their whole mission. And it's, you know, looking at media and healthcare and education mm-hmm. and political science. And and they're really coming in and, and doing what's called shock therapy. Uh, Naomi Klein refers to it as shock therapy. And uh, and these and this is it. You know, it's just done in this way that's uh, liberating. It's under the liber the neo liberation of uh, of these of these places. And so yeah, and uh, and this is the biggest of these. There's many, you know, there's arguments that there's a lot of these NGOs operating in this area at this time. It's true. But many of these NGOs have specific singular or maybe dual functions. The Open Society Institute has as what I like to refer to as a super NGO or a meta mm-hmm. NGO because it has this pyramid structure and it's got like 10, you know, arms in terms yep. of what it's doing to to do what it wants to do. Let's make your claim quite explicitly. You are suggesting that the resources extended by Open Society Institute, George Soros's NGO, have made a significant, a very significant contribution to the archiving, therefore remembering of historically resonant art in Eastern Europe, and to the development, the creation of a new field of contemporary art in those countries and embedding these within a slightly wider, um, democratic, but also capitalist, neoliberal, possibly globalist networks. I mean, this is the surface in a way. I, I think this is the, the, the you know, this is the, the very hard to penetrate surface of all of this because because my, my thesis really goes into this experimental anomalies that I discover mm-hmm. within this, what this network actually does that become, you know, really amazing questions, you know, that help reflect on paradoxes of free will and determinism, but also just show very, very advanced ideas of of contemporary art as we know it uh, Mm -hmm. appearing in these places that didn't have it prior, you know, and then the way that the his, you know, the histories get controlled around these things, it's made to seem like, no, these were, you know, processes of catching up. So it's, it's deep within these uh, details that become hard to see because of Philanthropy creates this thing called the halo effect that uh, yeah. pre- prevents us from seeing the the actual nuts and bolts of, of agenda and interest and influence and long games of investment or whatever. Um, you see the experiments of social engineering underneath that surface. So, shall we go into some of the details, some of the some of these experiments? Um, in the book, you refer to some of the flagship exhibitions that the network produced and, and a couple of conferences. There were definitely a couple that were slightly bizarre. You referred to a showcase exhibition that took place on a warship in the Crimea, mm-hmm. somehow you know, in the crossfire between Russia and Ukraine. And we're talking, this is already, this is, is it already the 2000s or is it still in 94, the 90s? 1994. So, okay, 94. So, you know, foreshadowing everyone. I, I think it would be good to hear about some of these, these methods that the network ended up deploying and maybe also to think about how it reproduced them between one country and another like yeah. how how this becomes a you know a stencil for the creation of certain modes of artistic expression and certain values that come with them my thesis has three important points to it and they all interconnect in a really special way and uh, uh, i'm arguing that the soros center for contemporary art network introduces 
the most advanced form of socially engaged practice that we've ever seen in the history of this conversation, which is a relatively mm -hmm. new one. Uh, if you do a kind of a forensic accounting of origins of art historical movements, what happens in the early 90s in Eastern Europe is more advanced than anywhere else in the world. And, and talking mm -hmm. about the, the collective, the artist as a collective biome moving in a particular way towards a particular topic. There are definitely these examples in history of art of individuals coming up against authoritarian structures, arguably, you know, proto social engaged practice. But in this case, because of the, um, the way the centers operated and the control they had over creative production, you're seeing an entire legion of artists in every single city in a very synchronized way functioning in a, and turned on as a, as a, as an activist organism. And, and there's then these really specific aspects of that and, and what this social engaged practice is when I argue it's the most advanced. The first argument is that none of these artists were doing this shit prior. They mm -hmm. were coerced into doing it because this was the path to freedom and how, how are they coerced because i think we're going to have to start quantifying some of these claims yeah. as we go along so i think an important thing to talk about is like artists should do whatever they need to do to butter their bread they need to for mm -hmm. whatever they need to do to survive they should do it i'm not making a major value judgment here that artists were manipulated or influenced uh against or with their will the the thing is is artists should do whatever they can do to survive survival is the true avant-garde of art. And, uh, and so th the reality these people were in was that the artist unions are now falling apart or getting dismantled. And there's this new sheriff in town that's extremely powerful and having 10 times the money of the state mm -hmm. in some places. And of course, you want to be at the front of the front lines with that one, because if you get in that door well, the promise of the global market is at your fingertips. And so a lot of these artists would drop their paintbrushes and pick up the computer mouse to participate in these uh, things that were on offer. Uh, uh, and this was done through what's called the open calls. Uh, open mm -hmm. calls are, in a way, the one of the cornerstones of my research because they kind of function like the smoking gun. And open calls exist in history, but they don't exist at this level. So in terms of how this influence can be uh, materialized and understood properly, uh, the open call is this moment of inception where artists are expected to make work in accordance with what these briefs told them. Mm -hmm. And some of these briefs were saying things like, we want you to go into fringe locations of society, mental institutions, slums, uh, gypsy villages, places that were not on artists' radar as places to make work. So they were suddenly expected to have like a, a strange social consciousness that steps outside of their the ego of their creative practice. And so already from these open calls, that's the point of inception or point zero where their practice has been forced to change and it's coerced because there's this promise that comes yeah. along with all of this. And then there's the, the, then they make their proposal and their proposal is in tune with what's being asked in the open call. The proposals would be then received by a board and selected for, let's say grooming and, uh, and which ones are they going to decide to invest money in to produce. Mm -hmm. And then there's this point in which the production then happens. And I'm speaking very generally right now. Yeah. Each one is a case study, each of these annual exhibitions and the way that, you know, create situations for production. We have to think about them each individually. But to speak generally, there is this this process that I'm referring to. How many of them were there across the network? Do you have a, do you have a sense? There were 20 centers. Each one did an annual exhibition every year. So hundreds. There's like borderline 200, you know, mm. um, but they're the years that I focus on are 92 to 95. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that happens in that period, because that's when the network is the most vulnerable. Mm. Um, and uh, we haven't talked about in how these things were established. The curators were um, these very special people that weren't often naturally curators, natural born curators, whatever that means. They were a, a new typology of, of mm -hmm. curator. So. Uh, just this social engaged practice, how it comes to be, this, there's this grooming process, and then boom, you have 30, in some cases, 30 artworks produced by the Soros Center for Contemporary Art that are unveiled in this annual exhibition. And then the annual exhibition will be announced with a press release mm -hmm. that will say things like the artist wanted to leave the gallery, the artist wanted to leave the studio, the artist wanted to enter social space. And so there's, there's this funny way in which they turn it into the artist's natural desire 
to do these things that were going out into society to, in a, in a sense, perform the duties, experimental duties of the NGO. And, uh, and so the, the, whereas the open call m- made them essentially do it. Mm-hmm. It, it, encouraged is the right word, but you know, if you're a desperate artist in Bucharest, Romania, you'll do whatever you need to do to maybe get that foothold in this promise. I'm going to interrupt you here and say that if you had presented this narrative to me and rather than Eastern Europe said the United Kingdom and rather than 92 said 99 under the auspices of New Labour, I would have said that all of this completely tracks because in Western Europe, in the UK arts policy networks and their implications throughout the rest of Western Europe, social practice gets established in exactly this way. I wonder if I can ask you for some examples. Can we point at the risk yeah. of being a little bit utilitarian, a little bit, you know, yeah, let's be yeah, art yeah. historians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are the artists yeah. who have been created, who have been made, whose careers have been internationally recognized through these processes? So, and, and to follow what you just said, this, let's look at this as the beta test hmm. for what you just talked about, you know, because it is quite a bit earlier. The, the way to really talk about this, I think talking about it as art is a way to misunderstand it. It's a part of this halo effect thing. Mm. Um, so when we when we call what the Soros Centers for Contemporary Art did as art or the production of art, it's like a, it's no different from the way we call that data gathering stuff cookies, right? Yeah. So it's like this funny way to protect yourself. And why would you think twice about this as art? The problem with the history of this is nobody remembers a single artwork that came out of this enormous production house of the SCCA <laughs> that's, history. That's a sign of success, I'd say. And these are, in some cases, some of the most well-funded and technologically advanced artworks of their time uh, by long shots, right? There's And there's no, no one who's going to be like, oh, man, remember that great SCCA work? I can tell you a bunch of them. But I don't think many people would be able to, and 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 certainly not in a very generic way. Uh, so one, uh, we'll we'll talk about the Battleship Show, I think, in a minute. Uh, mm-hmm. And that that's where you, I think, get probably the most iconic art. But the way to talk about this is through the curators. So uh, if I can just jump into my okay. second thesis proposal, first is about this most advanced form of socially engaged practice that we've ever seen in the history of art. Do a forensic accounting the way we do about histories of pop art, land art. Uh, origins of this behavior, look at it through social engaged practice, and you arrive at this enormous black hole called the Soros Center for Contemporary yeah. Art Network. The next part of my thesis is you see the most advanced form of the curator that we've ever seen in the history of the profession. And it's arguably at the birth of the professionalization of the curator. It's at the time when all these curating programs are being established at Royal College of Art, Bard, mm-hmm. and elsewhere, Magasin, and et cetera. Yeah. And this is a typology of the curator that we've never seen before. Prior to this, they're kind of like auteurs, uh, like savage auteur, kind of cowboy types Mm -hmm. like Harold Zaman or whoever. These curators are coming from very different kinds of backgrounds, some of them dissidents, poets, and some actually coming from art history. But a a whole kind of new army of uh, people uh, is just born overnight and given an incredible amount of power. These practices aren't just naturally existing. Many people in, in, in Estonia, it's argued that they didn't know what the curate, curator was until the arrival of the SCCA network. So to talk about what are the cornerstone achievements, what are the, what are the things that stick out? Um, well, there's this, but let's talk about this uh, emergent behavior phenomena that comes from this, mm-hmm. which is the, the template exhibition that I think is the thing that we then see echo across the network in these early years. And again, I stress, my focus is from 92 to 95. And after mm-hmm. 95, these things are kind of standing on their own, functioning autonomously within the, within the auspices of the open society, whatever that means. Yeah. But there's this early moment where nobody knows exactly what they're doing. And what's expected of them. And there's this uh, executive director named Susie Masoli, who's the architect of the, the whole network, who is the guiding force of everything that they will then do in those early years. And she makes an exhibition called Polyphony, which is in 1993. Mm-hmm. And Polyphony is this most advanced uh, exhibition of, of social engaged practice that we've ever, ever, ever seen. And, uh, and it's essentially an exhibition about bureaucracy, uh, using bureaucracy as a medium, as a raw material for artists uh, and for curators. It's about 
monument therapy, thinking about how artists can go into public space and reimagine the potentials of your monuments. Uh, it's also about reimagining what public space means. If you look at the open call for polyphony, it is literally a manifesto of some of the most militarized ideas of socially engaged practice nice. ever. And it's a recipe. And you should be, you should look at it like one, like as a manifesto and a recipe. And, and, uh, and it's literally asking a lot of artists who did not have these practices to do things that were going to, you know, take them outside of their comfort zone, to put it mildly. And it would provide them, in addition to this uh, manifesto ideological guidance, technological guidance. There's this promise of uh, allowing them access to different kinds of technological innovation that they would never have access to. And that ranges from media, publishing, uh, TV, radio, uh, even the, the Open Society Institute uh, lays a lot of the infrastructure for most of the internet that happens so throughout Eastern Europe in uh, in the mm -hmm. 90s. All the earliest internet infrastructure in terms of laying fiber optic cables, setting up satnet uh, connections, it happens through the Open Society Institute. And so these artists are also given this strange access to this as well. And and in some cases, you know, we're um, we're talking about a very unorthodox way of understanding what the artist practice is. And this is where my third thesis comes in, which is mm -hmm. the idea of tactical media as an emergent behavior. And uh, and it comes through this adjacent way that's happening through net culture at the time, network culture that happens to be highly uh, lubricated by what the open society is offering and uh, taking some of the most advanced thinkers of what become fathers and mothers of tactical media and giving them incredible agency to develop their philosophy and apply it. So it's not just this, this thing that's kind of formed in, a, in an academic vacuum. It's, it's literally the nuts and bolts of laboratory thinking. And tactical media is not art. Tactical media is mm. the weaponization. <laughs> it's the weaponization of perception and, uh, and treating perception like a game. And so when you take all these things in consideration, a, a visually illiterate environment where experiments in tactical media can happen and we'll just call it art. Don't worry, dude, it's art. Chill out. You're looking at a real opportunity to evolve the sensory being uh, on, a, on a level that's unparalleled in history. So look, in all of this, there's a constant undertone that we have the population of artists who are, by definition, innocent. Let's assume they don't know what's being done to them. They, let's assume, as per Zizek, that they don't know what they're doing, but they, but they are doing it. And you describe this kind of bureaucratic cadre of curators who are, if we're being completely unkind, they're being manipulators par excellence. But they are also finding, that, I mean, they're following a certain, certain idea. You describe in the book a character called Bill McAllister, who becomes the director of curatorial policy for the network, which is a kind of job title that we, we understand from museums now. But how do we square this idea that we have experimentation, whether it's to do with developing this laboratory for social practice, all these years before Nicolas Bourriot supposedly invented social practice and relational aesthetics for Western Europe, how do we square that kind of ideological bureaucratic approach with the experimental side of that and of tactical media, which of course comes with yet another set of very unruly influences at the time, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, media practices, all these technologies that open society and similar NGOs are very slowly thinking of bringing into Eastern Europe in a very patch kind of patchwork manner. However, there is a tradition already emerging of media experimentation happening in Central and Western Europe. I funny enough interviewed Gert Loving, who features in, in your exhibition. I interviewed him just a few weeks ago for the program. And he's a he's a big, big protagonist. So this is where the machine is. Think about the network. Uh, if you look at the map, it's these 20 centers. There's this early period where they're all vulnerable. There's a thing that I've mapped, and I'm talking about the years 92 to 95, where I've mapped all the exhibition histories of these places, and I've pinpointed exhibitions that have almost like a, a mimicry of each other. There's a, there's a like-mindedness is the nice way to put it. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, there's this impossibility uh, when we think of uh, the timing of these things uh, in terms of in a pre-digital era, the passage of information across borders 
in the Western art world in a normal day is never going to be this this way that we're seeing in Eastern Europe uh, in the in the early 90s. You actually see a simultaneous emergence of behavior happening at the exact same time. All these places creating the same ideas, the same kinds of ideas of exhibitions. And that's where it becomes really interesting. That's where you have to truly acknowledge there's an anomaly here. It's not just these three things that I said of social engaged practice de deployed through advanced curatorial practice with a nugget of uh, tactical media inside of it. It's the machine that turns it on and makes it everywhere at once. And when you think about it like that, like a virus, when you look at it from the macro view, it's, it's something that's phenomenal. How do we evaluate it? How do we know, given that you claim that those histories have been forgotten, and I will... I think we're both kind of compromised subjects here because we, we haven't lived in Eastern Europe for the last 20 years. So we, we can't really feel it in our bones whether, whether these histories are indeed embedded. You claim that the history of the network is largely forgotten, that the archive of the network, in the way that you described your, your interview with one of the directors, essentially people go out and say like, no, 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 let's, this, is, this is off my record. You even mentioned that some of the kind of more luminary members of the network have scrubbed their, their activities from their CVs, which isn't exactly evidence, but, but still. The question essentially is, how do we know that, that all of this actually contributed to the ideological change of Eastern Europe, whether in art itself or in, in fact in, in the democratic lives of the region, and how much of it was merely incidental? I mean, we have to at some point evaluate, is art yeah. as important as it claims? Is art practice when it's institutionalized, does it have the potential to be world building as in today's terms? Or is it merely, you know, an expression of experimentation that is inconsequential? I uh, am of mixed uh, beliefs around this. I mean, when we get a chance to talk about the show, my exhibition is really about mm. the echo of uh, the telephone game and how this moment of influence creates a whole you know, following generations of practice. And yeah, there's a, there is, of course, a great question of like, well, why, how dare you question an artist's autonomous ability to look at their identity constructively in these conceptual or direct ways? It's true. You know, it's very challenging, but it's like, it's through dialogue, honestly. I've had very transparent conversations with artists about mm -hmm. this. Curators connected to this are evasive. They are. Uh, they are not having very forthright uh, conversations about what this period means. And when they are, it's, it's careful. It's, uh, it's done carefully within the safety of a safe space or someone who's going to be, mm -hmm. you know, having a safe dialogue with them. So, and I'm an unsafe person in that regard. So how do you prove that it isn't just naturally occurring phenomenon? Well, we don't have a way to say, oh, this is how it would have gone. Uh, this is the way it went. But what is naive is to pretend that this was a passive steward or a or a or a, a babysitter or a, something that was just happened to be there and witness it and provided some money to, you know, no, it's not it's not even just gasoline on the fire. This is the change agent. This is the moment and the place and the people who put these ideas into uh, whole generations and communities and uh, places. And, uh, and yes, arguably, you can say that the, this kind of thing was happening. The 93 Whitney Biennial was the identity politics mm -hmm. biennial, but they were not doing socially engaged practice the way it's happening in Eastern Europe. In fact, there is in the Polyphony uh, book critique around how aggressive the identity politics they're trying to introduce are. And how uh, oil and water that is for what are the, uh, the cultural politics of, of, of Budapest mm. at that time, you know, trying to introduce, a, um, uh, it, you know, there, there's a whole there's a whole list. And if I have my book here and I can read it to you. This uh, open call of polyphony. And this is this goes out in February of 1993. The open call is asking that the range of social and political themes which may serve as the content of the submitted works extends to, but is not restricted to, the following. 
the transformations of power broadly defined, the, re the reevaluation of social roles, expectations, customs, and systems of values, the tensions of collective belonging and dispersal, orientation in the new objective ideological, emotional, and temporal environments, transformations of sexual and gender relations, a mapping of geographical, social, and institutional spaces or movement, the adequacy or inadequacy of the cultural, linguistic, and symbolic means available in this changed reality, a sense of responsibility for human and environmental resources, the problems of processing a private and shared past, present, and future, and the social and political role of fine arts in answering challenges like the above. Now, if I can add one other thing. Mm -hmm. One other thing is that Susie, the curator of this, was disappointed in the uh, the results of what this thing did. Okay, Susie also mentions that she had expected stronger social themes to be addressed, such as the war in Bosnia, abortion, Hungarian homosexuality, and gypsies. And just to add one other line from my book, this is where we now see there's this anomaly thing acknowledged already in 1993 in the fall – that at the same conference where we were discussing this thing with a slight bit of distance, the Hungarian curator Laszlo Becca addresses the fact that he has just come to this conference after having recently traveled to Tallinn and Bucharest to see their SCCA annual exhibitions. And the Tallinn exhibition and the Bucharest exhibition are asking the same questions that we are discussing here. And he's blown away. <laughs> and, and, and the radical thing, the detail that always gave, like that I shiver with when I think about what this could mean from a context point of view, uh, I talked to an, uh, an archivist from the SCCA Tallinn, uh, who's you know a young person now uh, functioning as the archivist. And, and she said, when I asked her about this socially engaged practice thing that happened there, she's like, you know, you're right. It landed here like a UFO. And I would repeat that to other places in Vilnius and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And they were like, yes, that's right. It landed here like a UFO. I think we need to talk about the why of all of this. Before we get into the exhibition, uh, which brings with it the question of the reception of what you've just proposed, let's address a little bit the figure of George Soros and what it is that he might want all of this. First, I mean, apart from the fact that we need to figure out who George Soros is, why on earth is he interested in contemporary art? Because he doesn't seem to be interested in contemporary art anymore. It's not like open society has been a great funder of the arts. It's, it's literally never been answered what his relationship to contemporary art is and why this huge investment. I mean, literally for its time, uh, the monetary investment is unprecedented, especially for the exchange rate of the dollar in these places at mm. that time. He's never answered it on record in any insightful way. And uh, and it's just left in this funny realm of it was one of many investments. Uh, and so George Soros, who is he? Uh, he's a magical human being in our cultural landscape. <laughs> uh, he's what uh, all political parties seem to refer to as a boogeyman yeah. uh, because of his, his strange cultural aura, which has created uh, very political tensions on both the left, the right, the middle, and and uh, ultimately he's, he's a, um, somehow a, a prophet for um, these open society values, mm. pro progressive values, uh, the, 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 the ways in which uh, he brings neoliberalism like a missionary to these places. Uh, it really makes him stand out as a, a, a singular phenomenon in our human landscape as a person who's really done the most to uh, help Eastern Europe and other places become pro-Western. And, and that's through restructuring of you know, financial markets and, and all these other things that I mentioned, education, political science, and art. But then there's this other side of George Soros, which is the, the speculator, the financial oracle who's been able to divine the energies of markets in all these different ways uh, through you know, currency speculation. But he was also a massive hedge fund person for the uh, for the internet and, mm -hmm. and the euro at the same time and and these of course play into the long game investments of what are these you know ngos doing there uh trying to create pro eu and pro technology um future societies um you know there's there are all these great curiosities of you know the sides of the coin in terms of where his interests are but you know george soros he is always identified as a as a Hungarian Jewish or Jewish Hungarian uh, billionaire. 
uh, who is, you know, this boogeyman of the mm -hmm. right is the, is the common way that we describe him. But I think there's so much more complexity to him than that. I think these 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 phrases are used to weaponize perception around him to kind of short circuit your ability to think about him in a neutral way. Yeah, what you've just described is kind of apt, and maybe maybe to think about George Soros in a slightly detached way, we could do that by trying to imagine the personalities of Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and maybe even Peter Thiel. But imagine that they are all kind of perfect neoliberals and also have some kind of nationalistic, non-American agenda to them. But imagine all of that happening in the 80s and the 90s before anyone gets to scrutinize what they're doing on a daily basis. And I think it's important to understand that none of this in and of itself is a value judgment. However, the moment we use the word bogeyman, and I think you quite astutely do that in your book, I mean, you, you've titled the entire section of your project with, with that word, I think it becomes very difficult not to start kind of seeing a little bit of darkness. Mm -hmm. And that's natural. I completely go along with that. You know, a billionaire and his influence over massive, massive chunks of the world, the way you describe, even if his influence was frankly just minimal, tangential, even if he had just funded one university in Budapest, you would still want to think about how that tracks down the line. But I do have to ask you, why did you decide to tackle the figure of Soros with all the difficulties that we're going to get onto now, including anti-Semitism, which is almost inevitable the moment you mention his names. Why did you bother including him at all? Like, how does it enrich your method of looking at the network and, and, the, and the history itself to include him as one of the, the research subjects? You know, I have had such a long passion for this subject. And, uh, and it's, and it's be, been so influential on my uh, upbringing as a professional and my understanding of the human condition and art and Eastern Europe, major, major passions. And George Soros was, has always had this uh, strange cultural aura to him, but it was lesser known when I was originally finding the project. You could find speculation on his motives or the problems of neoliberalism already back in the 90s and in the 2000s when I was picking this research up. But the way in which his name has been weaponized is is pretty new, especially in American culture. I think like mm -hmm. the, what, what I would find is the problem is I'd have to be tactical about how I told this story. I would I, because I, there was so much to tell. And I want to communicate my passion for Eastern Europe and what, all everything that's taught me, all these people and wonderful luminaries I've met along the way. I would tell everything about this story uh, the, mm -hmm. of the birth of the network, curatorial practice, and I would never once mention his name. Because the moment you mention his name, it's like a spell. It's like you've said a magic spell. And you see people's eyes glaze over. And they're protecting themselves. The moment you say Soros, they're protecting themselves from what they think is inevitably a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Whatever you're saying right now, I get it. I get it. No, 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 no. Excuse me. Uh, you know, get yeah. lost. And so when you see that as a pattern in society and people shutting down and their ability, and this is, I'm talking about editor and owners of art forum, editors of freeze, all these people mm -hmm. shut down. They, they cover their eyes and their ears and they dog whistle the moment you say the name George Soros, because they're clearly smart enough to know that you are doing the old boogeyman trick. And um, and so that to me was such a strange, like collective behavior that I'm mm -hmm. like, whoa, this is a uh, anthropologically important to think about as I construct this whole thing and think about it tactically. In a way, it's a gift that people respond collectively in such a way. And so, what is that gift made of? Um, it's made of a lot of emotional and unarticulated behavioral, like primitive behavioral responses mm -hmm. about cultural ideas. And so, I have gone through great lengths to confront the exact nature and origin of what that could mean and why it is the way it is and uh, and how that creates funny forms of perception management around this topic. Yeah. And that perception management has literally created what I consider to be the biggest blind spot in the history of art ever, which is knowledge about this thing. We are not allowed to properly acknowledge this thing, because if you do start to look at it and scrutinize it and question it, you are clearly participating in some kind of conspiracy theory rhetoric, which is bullshit. 
But then the question is why exactly that happens. I've already alluded to Elon Musk and Peter Thiel, who are figures who are clearly ideologically inclined. They are spending their money, not necessarily on culture, but they're investing their money into the reproduction of certain political ideas and reshaping society to their own image. Musk is a long-termist. Thiel uh, wants to turn us all Catholic and, you know, after René Girard. They're both succeeding to a certain extent. But to speculate on this is not to engage in conspiracy theory. This can happen all out in the open. But on the other hand, when it comes to figures like Soros, you start reading this kind of strange opinion pieces, like, is opposing the globus agenda of the World Economic Forum anti-Semitic at its core? Yeah. And it strikes me that it is anti-Semitism that is invoked straight away. I'm, I, wonder, I wonder what you think about this. Like, if Soros were not a Jew, would any of this veil be drawn over it? And, and it's, it's, I have to say that I mean, I'm 42 and I still do not understand the constituent parts of anti-Semitism except for this kind of obscurations that it produces in these moments. It completely baffles me to whose benefit this kind of cultural production of, oh, here's a subject on which we cannot talk, and it's, it's not even in the interest of the anti-Semite for this, for, for this to have occurred. I would like to actually address it from a point of view of anthropology. And there's a thing that's uh, really important to address, especially when we talk about uh, ideas of magical thinking uh, across mm -hmm. cultures. Uh, we have a thing called the evil eye. And uh, an evil eye is, uh, it manifests itself on a whole variety of levels all through the human experience. Even the irreligious one or the atheist uses the evil eye all the time. And it's through irony. Mm -hmm. uh, irony is a form of the evil eye. It's a way to protect yourself in your mind from things that are sincere. And, uh, and so irony is very actively weaponized in places that you're going to, you know, want to not be exposed to ideas that are going to hurt you. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's the an irony and parody. They function in this funny way. That's a performative uh, relationship to the evil eye. Uh, Antisemitism, anti-Semitic call out is another one of these uh, ways in which it helps uh, protect uh, and hide and obscure an issue. And I think it's important to really use really direct terminology like that, because until we have a grown up big boy conversation about what is uh, the what are the mechanisms of anti-Semitic call out? What are the rules of anti-Semitism? Because they're vast. When you actually start mm -hmm. to explore them and try to look at them as a recipe or as a rule book, it breaks down really hard and fast into like it's nebulous and, and can be anything. It's, it's basically anything that one doesn't like uh, to a certain degree can be called that. Yeah. But what I'm fascinated by is when it's used to short circuit conversations. So like the idea that we can translate now words like elites or globalization mm. or all these things like thinking critically about these ideas as now they translate into having a tinge of anti-Semitism to them. I mean, give me a break. This is, let's talk about it. This sounds like uh, kind of a, we're bordering on voodoo in language. I mean, it's almost like that this, this, this mechanism is anti-Semitism itself, if anything. Surely we're getting to the point well, where. Just where the mere discussion. Yeah. Yeah. This, the mere discussion we're having can somehow be called anti-Semitic because it's asking us to think uh, in a meta way about this very weaponized spell that exists in language. And, uh, and so without being anti-Semitic, I think that uh, it, it matters not that George Soros is Jewish. I think the fact that he is Jewish is something that's actively used by the media to initiate an anti-Semitic response, call and response mm. situation, to introduce him as a Jewish billionaire who is the boogeyman of the right. These are tactics of perception that have already swept your leg in his byline, and that if you're not already convinced that this is a problem, if you're thinking twice, you might be an anti-Semite. And so there, there, there's all these things that happen in, with just in taking the media as a case study for how the, the, this topic is managed and the perception around it is managed. Uh, the usage of anti-Semitism to help uh, weaponize or uh, create sectarian thought patterns in your audience is already very abundant with uh, a subject like George Soros. So it's important to step back and, and just look at this like thing as a, as a pattern and relate it to folkloric patterns uh, that uh, relate to superstition 
and how we uh, create protections against good and evil and, uh, and, and how they make us question ourselves and our own value judgments in the face of what could be something that's good or evil? Let's make it a quick judgment, and uh, and so these are these are snap. Uh, these are ways in which we short circuit the human mind. The moment that word appears, all bets are off. But kind of understand now why you would have gone and invested so much into that discussion. But of course, the frustration is that that it does not, in any sense, function as a palate cleanser. You don't end up writing a chapter about this mysticization of George Soros and, and, and the weaponization of anti-Semitism, because you ended up with, if anything, more. You, st- you have done nothing to silence the dog whistle, because that's not really under your control, and you end up with an extra problem to deal with. So I just want to say quickly, I did yeah. not create these rules. I did not create the <laughs> rules that were only allowed to talk about George Soros through the lens of conspiracy theory mm. that could then be quickly spun into an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. I did not create those rules. Those mm. rules are what were given to me. And in accepting the challenge of what those rules offer, I merely did my role to help uh, decolonize that space, uh, a la the, the, what, what I was taught through the language of curatorial practice mm. and even the Soros Center for Contemporary Art Network's rhetorical devices. And so I just want to quickly say that there, uh, I've cursed my book. You know, I, my book has a, <laughs> has a curse inside of it that you are now <laughs> Oh, you you thought that I couldn't talk about this without having to constantly butt up against this crazy yeah. conspiracy theory? Well, now you have no choice but to eat it too. Yeah. So maybe now let's get to the exhibition, because I think if anything is going to save us, it's maybe to try to think through these things in aesthetic terms. I didn't have the chance to see the show, but there was ample documentation, and I know a few of the artists involved, and I've, I've had the joy to even exhibit one of the works that you show and showed in my gallery at, at one point. And it's clear that you are trying to do all these things at the same time, to give a sense of the archive, the legacy, to give a sense of some of the mechanisms by which the network might have spread it as influence. And you do that by just illustrating the fact that some artists are aware of this, maybe 20, 30 years too late, but some of them are. And then you do have a section devoted to Soros. Maybe you could Talk us a little bit through the the method of the exhibition and how it helps to communicate or maybe how it hinders the communication of some of these ideas. My practice is rooted in gonzo anthropology, but it in particular is participatory anthropology. And I am a strong believer in, in invocation and channeling and embodying as I make a cosmology, which I, we can call an exhibition or a temporary autonomous zone to make it recursive because when it becomes recursive it becomes like a portal not just to look mm-hmm. at and about something but to be of and uh, essentially the thing itself and as an experience as a as a subject and so forth hard to explain but that's the, this is a methodology that I've come up with and so what I've done here is I've taken all the tricks that I've learned from making an archive about the curatorial mm-hmm. practice of the network and I've turned that into patterns, patterns of, you know, these ideas of monument therapy and neoliberation or precarity of the avant-garde or Soros realism, this new identitarianism that's specific mm-hmm. to the to the network. And uh, and so I've made these r- galleries that have allowed me an opportunity to think categorically about ideologically infused artwork. You know, it allowed me to deal with ideas of revolution in one gallery or the, the breakdown of structures in another or semiotic shamanism you know these these are terms i kind of make up they help me deal with the Mm -hmm. what are the the magic of uh things like tactical media and also the weaponization of of perception and so i've tried to come up with six quite coherent galleries uh each of which delves into conditions of practice uh and cultural production and and to me the the way the exhibition functions as a narrative is like a is a kind of of like a museum of propaganda or traumatology um, that you, especially someone coming from Eastern Europe, might have a very emotional relationship to this yeah. idea of that desecration is consecration, is desecration, is consecration, mm. you know, and this pendulum swing as you go from like 
communism to capitalism to Orban to whatever, every every paradigm has a new way in which it desecrates and consecrates. That creates a whole condition of perception uh, within the, the the viewer that I can't claim to fully understand. But uh, what I can claim is that I understand that the practices of the curators of the network, and I know that they were using things like tactical anthropology and participatory anthropology, and I've just embodied these things, and mm -hmm. I've found patterns in the way they did that shit, and then I've given those patterns right back, like a mirroring exercise, like a cargo cult or something. I am their worst nightmare in that regard, because I'm like, I'm like you taught me this, Dad. <laughs> And so, yeah, and then these exhibition rooms, they lead you through a traumatic experience. And then at the end, you kind of come to this this brain, which is like the explosive, pulsating, influencing machine brain. But And that's where we explore tactical media properly. Let's talk a little bit about the reception of both the exhibition and the, the thesis in, in Europe. So your exhibition has just been on show in Warsaw and before that in 2019 in Romania, if I'm, if I'm right. And the book has just been published a little bit post festum as a, as a catalog. And I've been in touch with a small bunch of people in Poland, which is where I have some working relationships. And I'm not going to be upsetting you here by telling you that, that there's quite a bit of opposition to what you propose. And I want to get quite granular with it because I think mm. this will help us trying to figure out whether the invocation of George Soros in itself is a conversation stopper. Like it would be interesting to try to see if we understand where the opposition comes from. So let's deal with the small, small things now. Your exhibition has been accused of reproducing anti-Semitic tropes to the extent of being anti-Semitic. Um, one of the artists who you show, who is now past, is David Dees. David Dees has been accused in interviews on YouTube of being an anti-Semite. He has produced materials that clearly have anti-Semitic imagery. The Anti-Defamation League claims in the blog post that he's an anti-Semite. I think I understand why you would, even knowing all that, why you would make a point of showing some of this work. But of course, nobody who would have accused you of anti-Semitism went and saw the exhibition. So, so how, do you, how do you motivate this kind, of, this kind of work? I think it's so naive to just write him off as an anti-Semite. He is probably one of the most open-minded conspiracy theorists from like an OG era of conspiracy theory yeah. thinking. And like, there's no way you can just dismiss his entire practice as anti Semitic. This guy is from a time when anti vaxxing was a liberal phenomenon, was a mm -hmm. hippie leftist phenomenon. Yeah. So it's like, it's so uh, amazing how the, we retrofit ideas, uh, especially with conspiracy theory. And we've done this short circuitry thing of just assuming all conspiracy is right wing and all conspiracy leads to anti Semitism. Mm. Uh, this is this is crazy uh, and unfair to what is a really rich area of of human uh, sci-fi thinking, and so uh, and David Dees is the ambassador of the most of, of somebody who's created a visual culture of conspiracy theory that is undeniably powerful, and yes, it certainly does have a lot of what we can call anti-Semitic rhetoric in it, but it is not 100% exclusively that, and nor did I include anything of his anti-Semitic work in my mm. show. That's the funny irony of this is like, I included the stuff around misinformation and false flags and the EU and you know the way in which this fight over uh, Ukraine is taking place and yeah. was taking place in 2014. You know, the, the fact that uh, Michael Jackson was maybe a, pedoph a pedophile does not make me stop listening to Michael Jackson. He's a great artist. And, uh, and the problem with David Dees is that he has actually inspired generations of people that the art world is not willing to recognize because they operate in the dark corners yeah. of visual culture, meme culture, 4chan, this, that, and the other. And I'm not trying to privilege hate speech or wacky stuff. I'm an anthropologist. I make a full spectrum whether you like it or not. Socially engaged practice should not feel good. It shouldn't always be this thing that's mm -hmm. made to be fucking holistic to your agenda. Sometimes I put up a mirror and it's going to hurt and it's going to be painful and you deserve it. If you feel those feelings, you are, that's, that means it's working. And so, uh, the, the whole problem with, uh, demonizing David Dees and using this word anti-Semite as a way to disappear his entire practice mm -hmm. is fully, uh, ignorant. Honestly, it's an ignorant behavior. And uh, and to not see the value of what he means in my show, 
on top of that, that is just like hyperbolic ignorance, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredibly frustrating because again, this is invocation. Even though, you know, having having spent a few minutes online trying to figure out the kinds of work that he had produced, I don't think we can absolve him completely of anti-Semitism and find. I'm not going to defend him. Yeah, that I mean, that, that completely agree. That's beside the point. But I think we still just this is so boring. But it needs to be said. We are in. A universe in which in an artistic practice retweets are endorsements and clearly this is not what you're doing and maybe there is a little bit of a gap between the anthropology which you say you're practicing and the exhibition practice but it frankly baffles me that this is this is the material this is the subject matter upon which this problem would manifest given that we've been investigating things through visual cultures left right and center Tip of the iceberg, yeah. though, dude. I mean, yeah. it's like, yeah, I put David Dees in a show, but I did a fucking major exhibition about George Soros at what's the world's first right wing contemporary art museum. At that point, I'm going to just continue adding as many insults to injury as I can <laughs> to test the waters and, and you know, to create a, prov- a provocative situation. And it's not just for fun. Okay, let's 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 take yeah. this one step by step, because I think this this is important. You've been a little bit of a drive by shooting victim of a much larger situation that is taking place in Poland. I don't know, you can tell me in a moment whether this has also been the case in maybe some of the other places that you've been launching the book and and talking about the project. But for listeners, um, contemporary art scene in Poland has been completely taken over by the government, which is broadly populist, broadly anti-liberal, so, you know, quote, right wing. And I do count friends amongst people who have either lost jobs or are about to lose jobs in senior curatorial positions. Now, Jasdowski Castle, the CCA Center of Contemporary Art, in which your exhibition just was, Aaron, was, I think, one of the first to go. The place has been essentially under boycott from the local art scene for now over a year. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if your show has got not a single response in the Polish press. Now, this is sort of important to figure out because what you are what you are doing in your thesis is not in and of itself a right wing message. And from our conversations before, in fact, I, I sense some hesitation from from this kind of automatic assumptions that the right has answers. I don't think that that academically it follows that we need to be looking in that direction because they're truth lies. I mean, there's nothing, nothing to suggest that. How do you, beyond this kind of challenge that you just proposed, now it's fun, we, 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 we making everyone swallow the red pill, what do we do when the audience just doesn't want to know? It's almost like the anti-Semitic trope. Because of what you are proposing comes from the right, from this tainted milieu, everything you have to say is, is worthless. Now, what do we do about this? Because the political project relies on us being able to get through these kind of barriers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Look, I'm my industry's worst nightmare because I am the ultimate insider. I've worked for Larry Gagosian. Mm-hmm. I've worked for auction houses. I've run museums. I've done my fair share to be a good liberal. And I am an anomaly of a liberal. I am a, a radicalized conspiracy theorist liberal. I am a uh, a liberal who is willing to pursue religious dimensions of practice. All these things that really are shut down in our industry as uh, naive or ignorant or problematic or whatever, whatever. I have opened my mind to all forms of ideology, not to adopt them, but to steal from them as a way to Mm. keep uh, my toolkit open. And so when I heard about the Uzhdowski Castle. It was deep in COVID lockdown. And somebody sent me an article and I was like, there's something wrong with this article. This way in which it's portrayed, I can read between, it was a New York Times article and I could read between the lines right mm. then. I'm like, this is a, a hatchet job. Uh, this, is, this is a PR campaign. And this to me looks like a very intentional effort to misread, misunderstand and misguide all perception around this thing as purely dangerous, don't touch it, look away quick, you know, let's drop in a bunch of dog whistle words to make our reader naturally respond the way we want them to. And when I read that shit, when you tell me don't look, I look harder. Actually, I have like this strange 
like it's not like I like negative energy. It's not like I like evil, but the mere power that society gives it forces me to look at it. And it's not because I'm an evil person. It's just like, whoa, dude, that looks like something that we are having a very primitive response to. Now, what does that mean? And when you say a right wing contemporary art museum, I'm like, what the fuck is that? Uh, what are they doing? I need to know. <laughs> And, uh, and not because I want to like understand right wing politics. I think I get it. You know, I understand what right wing politics mm. are. I really, uh, I, I understood already what right wing contemporary art was. And I wasn't convinced that it was powerful or existed properly. Right. Mm. And, and it truly doesn't. So what is wrong here? And I'll tell you what is wrong is that my story is the story of the inception of social engaged practice in Eastern Europe a practice that becomes proliferated through the biennial movement, gentrified across the global art world through these curators who become very established, carry it to Bard College. And, in, and it, it's, it's literally what is called astroturfing. They mm. astroturf the art world with this socially engaged practice idea. And then one day, daddy comes home to roost. Frankenstein's monster has come home. And that's what this right wing... <laughs> That's what this right-wing art museum is. They are literally yeah. mirroring our socially engaged practice back to us. And then they found me, a chaos agent, a neutral person who was willing to take a project that I knew could be politicized and which is about social engaged practice, and they contextualize it for me. So it's like all these great opportunities, honestly. I only see everything around this as a gift, and that's a semantic shift in language I can do with anything. That you tell me is a challenge. It's going to be this. It's going to be this. It's going to be this. I'm like, you're telling me I get all these things for Christmas? Let's go. Oh, God. I will pose the last challenge that, that I've heard addressed via me at you because I think it is, it is important. Actually, in, in the broader conversation of influence, the influencing machine is, is being mistrusted. So I've heard this from more than two people in Poland who, who essentially, in, in different ways, try to paint you as some kind of a colonizer, but actually forget you, they couldn't quite reconcile to themselves that one could go and describe their very recent past as indeed influenced by anything other than them. And this is, this is a horrible thing to learn because it turns out that you've been living under false pretenses. It's not even your parents' generations who were so deceived. It was probably you already. This is very recent, all of this. And of course, we do have a critical language by which this kind of behavior is generally written off as colonizing. Is there an answer to this? Dude, my project hurts. It's painful. It's, it's awful what I'm saying in a way. Or take the fucking blue pill and own it as like the most adva scientifically advanced moment in practice. It just happened to be given to us by an NGO. Here's the problem. Poland is the least important in my story, Warsaw. Mm. It was the place where the SCCA was, had a blip of, an, of a presence. It never made an annual exhibition. And it transformed almost immediately into a passive funding body. And so a lot of the argument is like, this story is not our story. This is not what happened here. Yes, that's kind of true. The, but there is this reality that I'm not talking about individual cities. I'm talking about the macro view mm -hmm. of this entire thing. I'm looking at it as an entire organism, a meta organism that has organisms functioning in each of these cities. And in a way, this is what frees me from this colonial thing, because I'm not talking about Poland. I'm not talking about Romania. I'm talking about an NGO, which happens to be mm -hmm. uh, an American NGO. So it's like, I'm, I'm talking about my people, if we want to be really frank. It just happens to be uh, an issue that's symptomatic of, of their people, you know, where they've been made into, you know, some, um, what, what's that word, iatrogenic kind of thing, where it's like the, the, the way in which this was introduced has created these problems. And, you know, ultimately, this thing is unfortunate, uh, this story. It's, it's an ugly story because it really makes a lot of, it's not just the contemporary art world of Eastern Europe, it's all of it. Honestly, it's the entirety. Uh, when, when we start to dig now, if we want to keep the conspiracy vibe going just for the sake of having good, open minded energy, why don't we look at the relationship of Bard to the Open Society University Network? It's mm -hmm. not recent that Open Society has set up shop there, they've been there since the beginning. 
these curators that were from the uh, SCCA network, they were teaching there already back in 93. Maria Hlavayova had a class and had mm -hmm. a, you know, a syllabus. There is this real question about the presence of the institutionalization of the curator having origins in this story. And, and that, when we think about Budapest and Hungary as a microcosm and how pervasive the idea of the lobby, whatever you want to call the, the person who is aligned with the, the Soros, the right wing calls mm -hmm. the mole, moles, Soros moles. This whole thing, it, it starts to really get scary. You know, when you think that Marta Kuzma, who ran SCCA Kiev, is dean of arts at Yale. You know, wow, that's that's quite a an Al Qaeda map. You know, when we start to break it down, and, the, and Marta Kutzma is a great example. She's someone who's never done interviews. We didn't even get to talk about the Battleship Show. So, um, so these are these are people that have uh, benefited greatly from their involvement in a social engineering experiment, and they've done their due diligence to uh, hide it in all kinds of ways, and that's passive mostly. But there's the occasional ways in which it's actively hidden. And certainly uh, when you call critics of it having uh, anti-Semitic motivation, that's a form of, of, of hiding it. Because it's like those people in Poland, when put on the spot, you know, I just did these public events. Mm -hmm. I am so excited for someone to come up and to my face, test me, test my knowledge, test my ability to talk about this, you know, because I am an outsider. I am a tourist. But I have interviewed everyone. I've interviewed more than any of the most advanced academics around this subject. I've had the most contact with Susie Masoli, who's the architect of this thing. I spent mm -hmm. a, a week at her house with a film crew. No one can claim that. Everyone who claims to be an expert or who is pissed off about my project is either peripheral or is from some generation that doesn't matter, to be quite honest with you. And so like, they should shut the fuck up unless they have something like a follow-up argument. Because it's really easy to go and say, to do a mic drop on my thing and be like, He's wrong. He's an American. He's an anti-Semite. Prove it. <laughs> right. I'm not entirely sure whether we're going to be in, inviting these open mic contributions to the program. We've already spent way more than an hour talking about this. Sorry, but, dude. Aaron, no, no, don't be sorry. I, I'm kind of excited with you. I started this conversation thinking that I would try to be fair and do right by, by your critics. And I, you know, maybe I've tried and failed. But I think my listeners will know that I'm, I'm also quite prone to the odd conspiracy theory. It's not because I think there's anything particularly exciting about this mode of behavior, but because there are so many transparent conspiracies in which we, in the art world, willingly participate and have participated for years. And, and the kind of problems in propagating the research that you have just described, I, in my very, very narrow and brief career as an investigative journalist over, over the last year or so, I've encountered blocks to one critique after another from people who should know better. Mm. It's, it's, it's very strange how tight these institutions are. Well, but in fact, it's not strange at all. This is what institutions do. The contemporary art world is, in fact, a very, very good scene for keeping liberal values and capitalism together. And I'm going to say kudos to George Soros for without any understanding of what contemporary art was and without, as far as we know, any real interest in, in aesthetics, he got it right. Well, you know, and I also just say this is, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is art history. It's just an art history that we've somehow not been given. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and the other way to turn that around is all histories are conspiracy theories.